Yeah, the, the, the connection between Vroom and Thrack, uh, the other guys have given their opinions as to what it is. Uh, how, ex what exactly is your take on it? Um, I, you know, I don't know what it's like to be, you know, I'm a musician, so I don't really know what it's like to be a listener, but mm -hmm. to me, if, for a band that I really like, I think it's... Um, I think it's really cool that there are the two records because none of the performances are the same. Although four of the pieces off Vroom are on Thrack, re-recorded after having played them live, so they so they really have a different they just have a different feel about them. The tempo is different, the sounds are different, but it, it's still the same band. Um, Vroom is uh, was just very very early in the band's history. We had actually only worked together as a six piece for about two and a half weeks and um, had some of the material written but some of it was written right in that two weeks about half of it maybe three quarters of it and then recorded in four days so it was a, about a three week period that the whole record came from mm -hmm. um, whereas Thrack was just a lot more involved we went out and played live in Argentina and for a month and then went into a studio and actually did the record quite quickly it was about three weeks for all the recording and then about a week and a half mixing. Mm -hmm. So for, for myself, I think it'd be really interesting to hear different performances so close together mm -hmm. of some of the same pieces. Some of the arrangements are entirely different. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was Robert who said that Vroom was sort of the rehearsal tape and Thrack was the, 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 the real deal. And well, that was the idea, although... It actually, Vroom got developed beyond rehearsal tape mm -hmm. uh, mode, and actually we have a bunch of stuff in the can on the digital editor from from before we actually started running the, the multi-track tape uh, for Vroom. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really good that I'm really hoping we can piece together for a real rehearsal tape, because it's, it's some, some of the stuff is improvised, mm -hmm. you know, just off the cuff on, on, on Vroom, but there's some other stuff that just came out of nowhere and we didn't develop it, and it just it's just really exciting that moment when you know something new appears and we jam out on it mm -hmm. and, uh, so Vroom isn't really the rehearsal tapes I suppose it's like I don't know I don't Blue know what you call it like a, like, like a, br a blueprint for this incarnation yeah yeah basically mm -hmm. basically it's kind of a starting starting point here's where we were at this point this, mm -hmm. is, this is what we can do in four days at this point uh, Adrian said something rather interesting about how Thrack was the product of uh, the result of you guys as a band putting yourself on the line in front of real people in front of real crimson fans yeah well i you know I, being new to the band i don't have that um i don't have that weight on my shoulders mm -hmm. <laughs> yet uh well, i mean we were accepted extremely well in argentina and part of that uh, part of that no doubt being argentina having lived under dictatorship for so long that people are really starved and really appreciative for music. Actually, Japan's kind of like that too, but but in a way that it, it doesn't. It's not really like that in America. Not in the big cities anymore. Mm -hmm. um, out in the middle of America, it is. But so we were received extremely well and added shows and you know. So we seem to be going over well with the Crimson audience. Although the audience was really very broad in Argentina, from what my experience of working with Robert. Uh, Lots of women. Sometimes half the audience was women. There were kids. There were people. People who brought their children from age one to up to eight. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a it was a different different kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You've done a lot of different things with with Robert Fripp. Uh, as a matter of fact, I guess you more or less accompanied him throughout the eighties and, and the early nineties. Uh, the yeah, guy we here has a list of all the the, the different bands and units you've gone through, like the you know, League of, of, of uh, Guitar Craft, or, mm -hmm. uh, League of Crafty Guitarists, uh, Sunday All Over the World, String, String Quintet, Sylvian and Fripp. Um, I guess each time you go through a different type of unit, it's just a different thing, and you just, as a musician, you have to uh, acclimatize yourself to the new environment. Mm -hmm. um, was this basically everything else, or was this, did you find this more challenging? With Crimson? Yeah, with this Crimson. Um, it's pretty challenging. I mean, I, in a lot of the other situations with Robert, we've played with really great people. Um, this is particularly high class of musicians. Um, you don't really get much better than these guys. And having them all together in one group is not something that 
most musicians would organize for themselves. You know, you tend to get a band leader who gets whoever he can afford, or or sometimes people actually don't even seem to want to work with musicians that are better than themselves. Uh, and I think in this situation, everybody's quite humbled by everyone else. Um, but you have amazing, amazing players all around. So it's in that way, the the standard is is about as high as it gets in rock and roll. And what specifically did you find to be the greatest challenges of, of playing in this group? Well, the greatest challenge personally is is uh, the fact that I'm playing an instrument that's still largely unexplored, uh, the stick, and the role that the stick is normally filled in rock and roll is already filled by Tony Levin. Mm -hmm. In other words, he's playing bass, or stick sometimes, but mostly he's playing bass, electric and, and upright bass, and fretless. Uh, so that role that the, that the instrument that I play that usually takes in rock and roll is already filled, so I have to find an entirely new role for the instrument. Um, that's my strongest personal challenge, uh, how to make the instrument sound, you know, how to, how, to, how to make the instrument sound right in the context. Sometimes that means playing bass with Tony. Often it means that I'm playing in an upper register with Adrian and Robert. Um, and six people is a lot of people to work with, so that, that's also a challenge, bringing the whole thing together. You are originally a guitar player, right? Um... Not originally, actually. I played keyboards when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I played cl classical piano from about the age seven, mm -hmm. and then electric bass and acoustic guitar, then electric guitar, and bass in the interim, uh, mm -hmm. and a little bit of violin. Mm -hmm. uh, but seven years ago, I, I started playing the stick, and have, that's what I've been playing exclusively. Mm -hmm. Do you do you think that Robert uh, appreciates you as a stick player who thinks like a guitarist, or uh, as, as somebody who is? Uh, uh, redefining the, the the stick. Uh, well, I I I think I think I'm in the process of of redefining a new territory for the stick. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people probably don't consider me a stick player like like many other stick players because I don't really play it as a solo instrument, mm -hmm. uh, which is what it was invented for and what the most amazing players that there are in the instrument. Uh, that's how they play it. Um, but but I think my musicianship is really really flexible, and mm -hmm. and uh, I can think like a guitar player. I can think like a bass player. I can think like anything else really. Mm -hmm. So do you think that's important for a stick player that he has a, a, a diverse background? Um, I think it helps right now because there's no tradition on the instrument. If there was a tradition on the instrument, then then you would think like a stick player. Uh, for me, the the tradition is. It, it, it's not really existent. There's no repertoire, really, although I'm working with some other, many other stick players we're beginning to put together a repertoire of stick mm -hmm. music. So, yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's still uncharted, it's still uncharted to, territory. Yeah, I guess it's kind of hard to generalize at this point. Um, who, who are some of the other stick players out there we would know about, just out of curiosity? Uh, you know, there's a couple in Japan that I don't know their names. We met one guy in Argentina, actually, who was really good. He had transcribed a bunch of Piazzolla tangos, mm -hmm. and he really, really great. Uh, there's a guy in London called Jim Lampy that's quite good, that has a, a record or two out. And um, there's a guy that I play with sometimes here in, in New York named Frank Jolliffe, who's a, like a bebop player, really which is quite an amazing thing to see somebody playing bebop bass lines and soloing mm -hmm. on the instrument. And there's a couple other guys like that. Randy Strom is another guy mm -hmm. uh, in California. And a guy in Italy who's actually the closest to my style of playing, uh, Marco Cerletti. Actually, he lives in Swiss Switzerland, the Italian part of Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So they're around, and they're great players. Mm -hmm. yeah. but in Crimson, getting back to the sort of the nuts and bolts of your... Um, of your relationship with uh, with Tony Levin, he mm -hmm. takes on the more traditional role, and then you sort of uh, experiment from there. You experiment on top of that. I suppose you could say Tony takes on the more traditional role. <laughs> I think the more traditional role is probably the key word. We're, we're doing pretty unusual things. Uh, and actually, a couple of the pieces, uh, Vroom, for example, and Vroom, Vroom on the new record, uh, we're actually playing double bass parts. Uh, where we're both playing bass simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And on, I haven't actually, uh, funny enough, I don't know which version of Room is on the new record track. We did two mixes of it. And I think the, I think the Beatles mix that we were calling, uh, 
is the one that made it on the record, mm -hmm. uh, which means you can really hear very clearly what everybody's doing, which is uh, a, a change for the band. Cause why, it's why, why is that called the Beatles mix? Well, the, the, like I said, I don't know that it's on the record. I've heard a rumor that that's the one that we put on. Mm -hmm. uh, when I left the studio, we had two mixes. One was a normal stereo panning with everybody kind of in, the, in a spot and Tony in the middle. And then the Beatles mix was uh, Robert, myself, and Pat hard left in mono mm -hmm. and uh, Adrian and Tony and Bill hard right in mono. Ah. So like the old Beatles recording where the drums would be all on the left and the vocals would be all on the right. <laughs> And uh, that, that was a really, that was a cool mix. Mm -hmm. So if that made it on it, you can hear very clearly that we're both playing bass parts. On Vroom Vroom, we actually are sometimes playing bass and harmony, uh, which is which is pretty wild. And actually in Vroom also, in the fairy finger section, we call it. The fairy finger section? Yeah. <laughs> Why do you call it that? Um... Well, that's what it is. Robert's doing the Robert's doing the fairy fingers, and Tony and I are playing bass melody. <laughs> okay, the, the guy who thought up the questions here has a very interesting observation. He says that King Crimson has always featured at least one uh, feminine-sounding instrument. There was Ian McDonald on the flute in the old days, or, or Mel Collins on sax, uh, David Cross on violin, uh, Adrian Ballou on his sort of uh, his, his, his rainbow sort of guitar, and now the, the Mellotron. Um, do you think the, uh, the the stick is uh, fulfilling that uh, role this time around, or is, is he kind of coming from left field? I, no, I think in a way that that probably is true. Um, although when it when it fills that role in this kind of a band, it's pretty subtle. Uh, so yeah, I think that is true. Mm -hmm. Which means it's that sometimes sometimes it's not very yeah. sometimes it's very aggressive. Uh -huh. Yeah. Like in Red, for example, which is not not recorded until we come up with a live record, but mm -hmm. it's, it's it's right up there with the guitars blaring out. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess though, in order to maintain a balance, at one time or another, everybody has to sort of branch out into a, a, a different kind of, a, of of texture. Yeah, and uh, that must be one of the challenges of this this double trio. I mean, everybody has a counterpart. Um, is, is the band functioning as a double trio, or is it just a, a regular six-piece? Uh, Adrian um, I think it was just a six-piece. He didn't buy, buy into that the double trio thing yet. Well, we're still trying to figure figure ways to make a double trio work, and uh, I'd I'd kind of I'd kind of straddle the line between double trio and a six-piece. Mm -hmm. It's it, uh, it depends on the piece and the, the part of the piece. Mm -hmm. um, Besides, who knows which trios are the trios? Maybe the guitars and the stick are the trio, and mm. the, the bass and the drums are the other trio. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly one of the trios, Pat, Bill, and Robert, have a a piece called the Boom on the new record. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's certainly a trio. Mm -hmm. And Tony and I actually did a stick duet, which didn't make it onto Thrack, but we're hoping to get it out on a some kind of single version of the record. Mm -hmm. So it, things kind of remain in flux at all times, I guess. It's not really a matter of two trios playing. Uh, no, no. Yeah. And Inner Garden also is a trio with Robert, Adrian, and Tony. Mm -hmm. So. There's a question here about uh, how it feels to, to, to play with, with each of the individual members, starting with, with Bill Bruford. Maybe you could uh, tell us what that like, what, what he's like, first of all. He's a pretty high-energy kind of guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, and he's very, very funny. He has quite a sense of humor, and he's a real improviser. Uh, he really shines in the improv. Their drum duets in, in Argentina were really outstanding. And I don't like drum solos, but <laughs> it, it, but it was really, really good. Uh -huh. Bill's very funny. Yeah. What, what, what makes him different from other drummers if indeed he is different? Does, it, does he have his own sort of distinct style? Um. He, he's a very, um, how can I describe it? He's, he's like, uh, he plays up, he, he's a very high registered drummer, and he can play really, really quickly, very, very precisely mm -hmm. uh, from the technical side. And, and he has a sense of humor in his playing, and I think he, he, uh, his playing always surprises him. So he's, he's very, very different than Pat. Pat is like the earth rumbling. Mm hmm um, and Pat can play really fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, he can keep up with Bill, um, but he's just a—he's just 
it just has a really fat, huge sound, and Bill has a Bill's like a bubbling, uh, I don't know, bubbling spaz on top, kind of. Well, he's a little more playful. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Pat is more, actually, what Adrian said was Bill was more jazz and Adrian's more rock and roll. Yeah, yeah. That that makes sense? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Bill actually is probably closer to a, a classical drummer, uh -huh. percussionist, mm -hmm. really. And I would say. Okay, and how about uh, Tony Levin? What's uh, what's it like playing with him? Um, actually, Tony. Well, Tony, I've known for a while, uh, but we're still uh, both Tony and Adrian and, and Bill. And uh, I haven't really known them very long. I, I think that's my phone. That's, can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but Tony's really good. He's a real improviser too, and incredibly solid. The most solid musician I've ever I've ever played with. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really like him a lot. So we, you know, we hang out together and we started working on sick duets and mm -hmm. he's a really, uh, really personable guy. When, when you say solid, what do you mean? He keeps perfect time, never hits a note out of place, that kind of thing? No, he doesn't. He, 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 it's funny, he can kind of turn it on and then, yes, you're right, he, he, he every note is there. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's also quite happy to just go for it mm -hmm. and not not worry about if every note is there but when it comes time for it to be nailed he only needs one shot mm -hmm. um which is pretty it's pretty outstanding especially when you're playing fretless bass and you have to be in tune uh -huh. it's quite amazing how about uh, adrian adrian um actually uh, adrian's an amazing guitar player um i think adrian and i are still getting to know each other Oh, he's the guy who I think I've, I've known the least amount of time than anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, and a great songwriter. I think without Adrian, we this band would be the band from hell. <laughs> he provides the material. Um, well, actually, we all write the material, but mm -hmm. he, he kind of makes a song into a song mm -hmm. uh, when we need that, which I'm really happy that we have that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also happy that we have the other side, which is... Uh, just a real powerful thrash mm -hmm. uh, and and Adrian's you know when you have a lead singer who doesn't play an instrument or plays an instrument but, but not that well you're kind of stuck with a kind of a certain kind of material that you have to go with and mm -hmm. because Adrian's such a good guitar player and he's happy not to sing and he's happy to as much as he is to sing we can have such a broad spectrum of music that rock and roll just didn't, generally doesn't allow for mm -hmm. Um, question here about the uh, the material you actually cut in Argentina. Is any of the live stuff uh, uh, featured in any shape or form on, on Thrax? Um, I'm just thinking. Uh, it's some of Robert's uh, soundscapes that we that they pieced in, especially over the drum duet. I think those come from Argentina, but I really couldn't tell you where they come from. I think everything else. Running down the list here. Uh, no, nothing's from nothing's live. Mm -hmm. I've heard a rumor that they're putting together a live album from Argentina. Mm -hmm. I've heard some of the DAT tapes, and just the DAT tapes alone, some of it sounds amazing. In fact, Robert even said to me a couple of weeks ago that some of the older material sounds better than it ever has. Uh, Larks two and Red and uh, Talking Drum have, mm -hmm. is is the best the pieces have ever been played. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have the instruments now handle all the parts and, and, and give it a full powerful sound that they've never had before. I never would have, I, I never saw the last Crimson with Adrian and Tony uh, in the 80s, um, although I heard the records. I couldn't imagine that group being not full enough, but that that's what Robert said to me, that, that, that there was something missing in that group, which is, is hard to believe, but when you hear the six piece, it's, I might agree with him. So. From what you say, Trey, it sounds like you kind of um, you sort of distance yourself from the the, the the creation of the final product. Like you weren't sure of which uh, uh, version of, of Room got on on track, and uh, you talk about maybe there being a live thing, a, a live uh, album in the works. There, are, are you the kind of band member who just sort of steps in to play the music and, and learn the music, and, and then you sort of uh, retreat from the scene? Well, actually, no. <laughs> 
funny enough, just the opposite. In fact, I probably spent more time in the studio than any of the other guys. I really like to work in the studio, and, and David Botchel, the engineer, and I work together on a lot of things and, and get along really quite well. So I wouldn't I wouldn't want to say that often I was wearing the producer's hat, but 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 uh, in a way I, I, I in a way in the studio, no, I was I was there. In fact, through whole all the mixes. David and I would actually, you know, set up all the mixes, uh, and you know, roughly call a lot of a lot of the shots. Um, I mean, Robert really trusts me, and some, I think the other guys are, are, you know, trust is something that you have to build up over time. Um, the only reason, well, but, and we virtually finished the whole record because we were putting it into the digital editor as we were mixing, because a lot of the key thing to making this record work is the flow of the songs and the order of the songs and. We had a lot of material that we threw out, and we edited pieces out of it just to make it more concise and take out what was unnecessary. Um, but the the uh, that particular room mix is very funny because I had the idea for it. Um, I kind of woke up one morning and I thought, you know, why don't we do a real double trio mix, Beatles style? And then when we mix room, uh, it sounded so good that I thought, well, we don't really need to do it anymore. And Robert was like, no, no, you know get in there and do it you know it's only going to take you another 10 minutes to do it mm -hmm. so i probably would have blown the idea off if robert hadn't you know said no it was a good idea let's try it mm -hmm. and then i left one day early and uh i think robert was talking to pat after pat got the dat because almost everybody left early except for robert and i uh and pat said the room was the only one that he wasn't quite sure about and so robert uh robert said yeah you're right we'll use the other one so, but I, this is what I've heard. I don't know. I haven't been in touch with Robert for about two weeks. Mm -hmm. So, how, how does so no, I'm quite involved. And as far as the live record goes, uh, our kind of technician editor, David Singleton, is constantly going through dat tapes to see what we have because there's so much material that goes by we can't even really remember it ourselves. Uh, I mean, the live show got quite long and it spans you know, quite a spectrum of the band, and there's improvisations in the show, so kind of David goes through the tapes and sees what he likes, and uh, we did a video when we were down there, but the video looked so bad that we decided we didn't want to use it, although the sound was quite good, so he's constantly putting stuff together, and when he has something, he says, you know, what do you guys think, and uh, so that's why I say about the live record. Yeah, yeah, I see. So it's it's more or less thought of as, as Robert's band, but I mean, did the, does he actually delegate responsibility, or is it more of a sort of a natural evolution kind of thing? People just uh, offer their input, and then uh, it's it's a matter of the, whether or not the others others want to accept it, or how exactly does that work? Well, I think the way it's worked so far is that uh, Robert has a particular vision and a particular feeling of how uh, what the band will deliver you know what crimson is uh and then in general we go for it and he kind of has a barometer whether he kind of has an internal barometer of whether something is is crimson or not uh and we kind of check against that barometer and it's quite it's not even a stylistic barometer it's just kind of a feeling about whether it, it it fits uh, every pretty much after that everyone takes responsibility for themselves and we can do whatever we want mm -hmm. uh so he's he's really just kind of a barometer he's not a in any way a dictator at all although i have heard rumors that he has been in the past i think you'll find from talking to the other guys it's just not like that anymore mm -hmm. um but he is a good check because without him it would be terrible <laughs> <laughs> is he ever uh difficult to work with ever exasperating or, or the rest of the band for that matter no he never has been for me uh-huh never through all the different projects you've been through no never is that right how about the band now I, I hear that you know maybe he you know he has a very strong personality and so does bill bruford is, are there any sort of uh, sparks or uh... no i think you know i'd never knew the guys before i could see i can see where there would have been tension in the past but mm -hmm. but they've been playing together for almost 25 years mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot you know I think a lot of the frustration for Robert was that there wasn't it wasn't this band yet you know there wasn't all the everyone had to double on roles and not necessarily every personality fits into every role so 
you know, now we have many of the different roles covered, and, you know, Bill's happy to even sit out four bars. Him, we, we did a version of Red where him and Pat were virtually trading every eight bars. Um, and there just seems to be a lot of flexibility. So, no, I, there haven't been any tensions yet. No doubt, if the band becomes very successful, I think it will get a lot more complicated. But mm-hmm. right now, right now you can't really say that we're successful. <laughs> what, what, what would define success? Uh, big uh, tour uh, record sales? Uh, um, you know, I I have never worked at a, as a high a level as this is going to be, so I can't really say what it's going to be like. Mm-hmm. But I think when everyone's fawning all over what you do, I don't know. I'm not sure it's such a healthy thing. Hmm. I think you really have to keep it in balance. Mm-hmm. Because, you, because you think that you're, you know, you, you just kind of lose your, your humility. You're not so humble in front of the music anymore. Mm-hmm. And then things start to go downhill, <laughs> unless you get humbled. And I suppose having someone throw a tomato at you is pretty humbling. <laughs> But if everyone's telling you you're so great, mm-hmm. you know, people would start to get cocky, as you normally would. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Um, there's uh, one of the more uh, exasperating uh, things for us on the journalistic side of the fence is uh, the way Robert describes King Crimson, the concept of King Crimson, how you know, he sort of is visited upon by a a little fairy from time to time who, who tells him that, you know, the, the, the King Crimson con- concept must be uh, revived once again. Well, that sounds like something that would be great to write about. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on who your audience is. Um, you know, he, 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 he explains it in very um, abstract terms, and I it w- was thinking that maybe it would be the same for the musicians. You know, he, you, you're working your butt off, you think you've created something good, but he says, nope, nope, this is, it's good, but it's not Crimson. Yeah, that hasn't happened that much, mm-hmm. actually. We've been pretty much on the on the nail so far. It's just really obvious, I think. And you don't even have to say you don't even have to think of it like whether it lines up with the little fairy that comes on your shoulder. It's just whether it sounds right. On, whether it sounds right. I mean, when putting to the putting the record together, there was a couple of pieces that just didn't. They were greatly played. I mean, the, the duet that Tony and I did on Sticks uh, called Internet was great. Great piece, great played, cool sound, but it just it just wasn't right for the record. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and I, I think between six opinions, I mean, we certainly do, we don't really vote, but, off, you know, Robert, and Robert doesn't have the last word, because oftentimes we do override him when we think he's wrong. Mm-hmm. But between six different opinions, we get it, we get it right. Um... Were you a big uh, Crimson fan before you joined? Hello? Uh, your your voice all of a sudden fuzzed out and then disappeared. Uh, okay, I don't know why that was. Maybe you're 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 using a portable right now or something. Yeah, I just changed the battery. It seems we've been having problems, but I am in New York in a big apartment building. So. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, those things, things happen. Well, actually, we're down to about the last five minutes now. So okay. Um, I was just asking you, uh, if you uh, were you always a big Crimson fan, or was it something that uh, you came upon later? Um, I knew of the first record, but. At that point, you know, I was only about 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, And until 1980, no, I wasn't into the band at all. Mm -hmm. Um, But when I heard Discipline, there was... At that time, there were only two records that I really, really got me excited. That was Discipline, King Crimson Discipline, and the other was uh, John McLaughlin and the Mahavishnu Orchestra, Visions of the Emerald Beyond. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there's this... I mean, I was really into guitar playing at the time, and those are just amazing guitar mm-hmm. and drum albums. Uh, and since then, I uh, around that time, I tried to go back, but it, the, the earlier the earlier music doesn't get me as excited as some of the later stuff. Some of the earlier music does, but only a few pieces, and pretty much we're playing them. 
except for a couple that I that I'm hoping will work in. But mm-hmm. um, it's yeah. Uh, most of the music for me comes from a different time period. Some of the some of the pieces come from what you would say outside of time. Uh, the the pieces are very eternal, and and I think you could play them for a hundred years, and they wouldn't sound outside of time. Some of the other pieces sound dated to me. Mm-hmm. Robert often says that. Uh the musicianship at the time was rather limited, and some of those pieces just didn't reach fruition at the time. Um, that's probably true. I suppose we'll find out if we can play them, and, and, and I'm convinced, then, then that's true. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the... Uh, for me, I think Adrian's just... Without, I hope, offending someone, Adrian's just a far better vocalist than any of the other vocalists. Mm-hmm. And the vocal pieces, for me, just date... They just date, mm-hmm. whereas Adrian's vocal pieces, they don't. They don't. Th- I mean, they kind of sound like, the, you know, the early '80 pieces have an early '80 feel to them, but some of them don't. Matai Kudasai, it, 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 it's not bound in, it's not ba- bound into fashion, uh, mm-hmm. whereas the earlier Wet and, 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 and Lake vocal styles, they are for me. Mm-hmm. This is a question that's probably not right from you, seeing how you were never a big Crimson fan, but there. Some some are seeing this uh, are seeing Thrak as sort of a, a compendium of, of Crimson styles thus far, and uh, you know album names such as Red and yeah. Islands have, have been bandied about. Um, well, I wouldn't say that I'm I'm not a fan exactly. I mean I've gone back and uh, and, and certainly really gotten inside a lot of those other pieces. They just aren't records that I listened to at the time. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I agree. I think I think we have the best of the Red Band. Uh, and probably some of even the first record uh, available. But uh, Red, and Red for me, is, is just the seminal Crimson piece. That piece is, is just power, and it always works. That piece always, always works. Mm-hmm. So, And we play Red as a six-piece incredibly well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and I think Vroom, the piece is Vroom. And Thrak, actually, Thrak is a piece that Robert and I have been working on for a long time. Uh, so yeah, I think you're. I think you're right. I think it does bring a lot of the styles together. Mm-hmm. Having accompanied uh, Robert through all, these, through all these different projects and, and units, uh, did you see this? Uh, could you predict this uh, inc- new incarnation of Crimson coming? Oh uh, yeah, we've been working on it for at least four years, maybe five years. Yeah, I, I heard that the original idea came about about '91 or so. Uh, no, I would say '88. '88. <laughs> But it wasn't necessarily voiced so clearly. Mm-hmm. How did how did the the seeds first come about, or how did you notice it? Or um, you, I just knew that it was a possibility. Mm-hmm. You know, and 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 a lot of things that Robert and I were working on obviously were leading up to something. And when that something appeared, it was clear what what we were what we were up to. So, uh, so the little fairy visited you too. Um. Well, he maybe didn't. He didn't sit on my shoulder and yap in my ear. But you know, it's, it, when you look back, you see how the, how the you can see the pattern emerging, and sometimes you can actually see it emerging as it's coming. Um, I mean, Robert and I have been building a vocabulary together for a, for a long time, um, and sometimes that vocabulary just wouldn't work with Crimson, like the stuff that we did with David Sylvian. Mm-hmm. Some of it's Crimson, but a, 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 a lot of the other vocabulary. It, it was just something that we needed to use with David. You know, we we kind of discover it, and then you figure out where it goes. Uh, but some of it clearly was mm-hmm. this, no other band could play this but Crimson. Mm-hmm. You know, and and just kind of hang out until it happens. When you say that no other band could play it but Crimson, what exactly are you referring to? Like, it has to be like a, a rock band, what we would call a, a rock and roll band. Um. Well, there's this sophistic there's a sophistication without losing the the rawness of it, mm-hmm. uh, which is generally, I mean, there are some really fine players nowadays where you didn't have them 20 years ago in rock and roll, but mm-hmm. um, often the really, really great players, um, they don't necessarily have the rawness because you refine things and you, you lose that rawness. And there's there's sophistication in the emotional quality, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, you... you you hear Vroom or, or, or Thrak, and, and, and I don't know who else would play it. <laughs> <laughs> the 
and, and finally, what, what exactly is, is Robert Fripp to you? I mean, is he a, a, a musical visionary or just a very uh, sort of uh, a shrewd, shrewd-minded uh, uh, a musician, or how exactly would you uh, would you characterize him? He's a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. He's a very. Uh, I really like working with him. He he's has a very. Uh, what from normal uh, professional music standards very unusual ways of working that I really really relate to that that, that work for me um, we work really really hard and really really intensely and then we stop mm-hmm. and I really like that there's, it's like an on and off switch there's no there's no there's no fiddling around in between with you know are we sometimes you ask yourself what am I doing you know am I practicing am I writing am I playing are we rehearsing or whatever and there's none of that we're either on or we're off and it's good because you, when you're on, you're on, and you can work really, really quickly, and then you can just turn it off and and get away from it. Having worked with him so much, I would imagine at this point it must seem difficult to imagine uh, life without Robert Fripp now. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've, done, you've been through a lot together. Yeah, yeah, and I hope there's a lot more to come. I'm hoping that we'll, we'll work with David Sylvian again. That's uh-huh. what I'm really looking forward to. Yeah. That's Especially that's after the Crimson happens, it'll uh-huh. we'll be. I don't know. We'll be so so much of a richer because uh, we are growing which is in a way unusual for what you would normally I'm not I'm not I wouldn't call myself older but I am the youngest guy in the band mm-hmm. but for what you would say middle aged I suppose I suppose that would offend everyone but guys who are in their late 30s and 40s you don't think of rock musicians as growing beyond that point mm-hmm. and uh, we are mm-hmm. all right well Trey on that note I shall leave you to your own devices <laughs> Okay. Thank you very Thanks, much for your Steve. time. And, um, and uh, maybe we'll see you when we get there. I think we're coming in October. I don't know. Not but sure. I think we're uh-huh. coming in October. All right. Okay, great. Well, you take care, and uh, best of luck to you. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Bye. Bye.